And we're looking at the identifying statements Jesus made. And, you know, for us, uh, I think Jesus is easier to understand because we can see his life and ministry. But really, he's a part of the Trinity, the Godhead. And, and God is always a kind of a mysterious figure. He, he, we, it's hard for sometimes for us to fully grasp who he is. He, he has no end. He has no beginning. And so, but God says, listen, I don't want to remain mysterious. That's why he sent Jesus. And he says, I if I remain mysterious, he goes, you're not going to want to love me, nor are you going to want relationship with me. I, I desire that I would be understood. Because what happens in any relationship, and your heavenly father is the exact same way, that when there's dis distance, it creates distortion of who that person is in that relationship. The closer you get to that person, the, the distortion goes away because you're not going to have to assume things or interpret things. You just know, hey, that's who he really is. That's who they really are. And so God came along with these I am statements to help us understand who he is. And what's interesting is in the Old Testament, there were very similar I am statements about who he is that he declared to his ch the children of Israel. And so he said several things. He said, number one, like he's a provider. He's a banner. Uh, in other words, he's something we, we rally behind. He's peace. He, God says, I, I am a shepherd. He says, I am righteousness. He says, I am an ever-present help in trouble. He also said, and, and for example, Exodus 15, it says this, I am the Lord who heals you. He says, I am your healer. And God had these I am statements in the Old Testament, seven of them, these declarations. And then we go to the New Testament. And Jesus had seven declarations himself. And this is what he said. And we talked about one already. I am the light of the world. He says, I am the bread of life, which we're going to look at today. He says, I'm the way, the door, the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection. I'm, just, I'm the one that comes into your darkest moments, the moments when you think it's all over. And I say, no, this is going to live. There, there's going to turn around. There's life. And he said, I'm also the vine. I'm the one that you connect to. And so today I want us to look at I am the bread of life. It comes out of John 6, 35. And I'm going to read this right now. And then we're going to go all the way through the story. And you'll see why Jesus says, I am the bread of life. So verse 35. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty again. I am the bread of life. Amazing. Now, when you look at verse 35, and you look at that statement, he says, I am the bread of life. He says, whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Imagine that, living a life of total satisfaction, not having the up and down roller coaster of hunger. You know, for me, I, I, I get hungry every couple hours. So, you know, at the beginning of staff meeting, I'm in a good mood. By the end of staff meeting, I'm cranky. I need to eat. Like, it's just two hours is, is like a, is a year to me, right? So it, we get hungry, and hunger changes who we are. Sometimes we make bad decisions when we're hungry, right? But Jesus says, listen, that's who I am. I am the, the bread of life. Now, bread then and, and is today was not a luxury item. It would be something that you would identify it as a very basic food. So I always wonder, like, why did he say I'm the bread of life? Because if it was me and I was going to give myself a food, I'd be like, I am the T-bone. Like, you know, or like, like, I'm the brisket everlasting, you know, like, you know, or, 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 you know, for some of us who don't like carbs, you'd be like, I'm the salad of the spirit. Like, I'm just light and crisp and just there, you know. Some of y'all be like, yeah, I want the paleo savior or the, you know, the, the ketosis king. Like, he just burns fat all the time. Like, you know. But he says, no, I'm not that. He goes, I'm bread. Pretty basic. These fundamental ingredients back then, everybody understood it was a staple of the diet. It's something that every person had every day just to sustain life, whether rich or poor. It was a part of who they were. And so Jesus often used food to illustrate things. That's why I love him so much, because he loves food. Scripture says it's going to be a seven-year feast, a seven-year meal. Like that, hello, like that's awesome. That's worth giving your heart to Jesus right there. Um, and so he used food a lot to illustrate things. And so I want to share a miracle real quick that Jesus, we're going to see actually take place later in John 6 as we jump into that. But I want you to pay attention to something that Jesus says about in the context of bread. Watch out. Look at this. Verse 6. Watch out, Jesus warned them. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. At this, the disciples, that is, began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread. So like, oh, crud, like who's supposed to bring the bread? Jesus knew what they were saying, and he said, you have so little faith. He goes, why are you arguing with each other about having no bread? Guys, 
What is wrong with you? He says, don't you understand, verse nine, don't you understand even yet that, don't you remember the 5,000 I fed with, with five loaves and the baskets of leftovers you picked up? Or verse 10 says, or the 4,000 I fed and the seven loaves and the large baskets of leftovers you picked up? He says, don't you remember these baskets? Don't those baskets remind you that I am more than enough in any circumstance, that I am bigger than the problem? Do, doesn't that remind you that, that no matter what you're going through, no matter if it's a, a single loaf for, for lunch or 5,000 loaves for a crowd of people that, 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 that I can provide for that? Or are you just, did you just eat the bread and forget the lesson? Did, did, did you feed the, see the 5,000 fed and the 4,000 fed? And, 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 and doesn't that, don't you remember? Because I always thought it was odd that Jesus made them pick up these baskets. And I've always wondered, you know, was Jesus just trying to pick up and, and have a doggy bag? Was he, you know, just frugal and like, well, we can eat this later? Like, what was the point of that? If he just literally took five loaves and multiplied it to feed over 5,000 people, why bring these baskets along in the first place? And why 12 baskets, one for each disciple? Well, the reason was is because he wanted to remind them not just to eat the bread and forget the lesson, but to eat the bread and remember the lesson and remember the faithfulness of God. Because what is amazing to me about this story here in Matthew, in Matthew 16 is this, is that Jesus drew no line of difference between the provision needed to feed 5,000 or 4,000 and a loaf of bread for lunch. He saw that provisionally as the very same thing. He didn't say, oh, well, that was a big miracle. That was a big thing, and that's a little thing. We see it in that way. But for Jesus, for God, our Father, who provides all things to us, who's good to us and merciful to us, he doesn't have big problems and little problems. He doesn't have big needs and little needs. He's just a provider, so everything is the same to him. We're the ones that have a difference. So if I, like, for instance, I said, hey, I, I want to take Mark and Laura out to lunch today after church. I just put it on my, on, you know, my debit card, and hey, we'd be fun, no issue. If I want to say, hey, everybody from both services, I want to take you to lunch, I'd have to sell a child. Like, that's just how I'd have to do it. That's, that's it. That's how I'd have to pay for it. Why? Because it's, it's such a big need. And but for Jesus, he says, whether it's a loaf of bread or feeding 5,000 people, it's all the same to me. It reminded me of Ephesians 3.20 where he says this, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than what we could, might ask or even think. God says, I'm bigger than your bigness. I'm, I, you may be thinking about a loaf of bread, but I've already fed 5,000 people. But I think like the disciples and like us, we forget that those baskets represented a lesson about God's provision, that God is able to do much more than we can think. So when we go through the bad times again, the things that, 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 and we survive the things that should have killed us, and we overcome the things that should have taken us out, and, and that, that God is hoping that we'll carry around a basket in our soul of remembrance of his goodness and his provision in our life. That God gives us leftovers of moments and stories where we tell people about what he's done so that when we face another impossibility, when we face another need like that, when the storm whips up, when the problems arise, when the marriage gets rocky, we don't bottom out. We dig into the leftovers from the last time that he was faithful in our life and we encourage ourselves because we miss the lessons of life and we change the meaning of life if we think that, man, it, 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 you know, God's, I don't know if God can do this at this time. Matthew 16, 11, he asked him a question. Why can't you understand that I'm not talking about bread? He goes, what about this are you missing? So again, I say, catch it, beware the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then at last they understood he was speaking about the yeast and the bread, not about the yeast and the bread, but about the deceptive teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So he says, as long as you're fixated on the bread, you're going to miss the point. As long as you're fixated on the provision, as long as you're fixated on, on what you're hungry for and you're not hungry for the right things, he goes, you're going to miss the point of life and you're going to miss the true spiritual things of life because you're going to be worrying about the wrong things. He says, what I'm talking about is what you spiritually digest. You live out, you're a spirit being first. And he says, so what you spiritually digest changes who you are. What you feed on changes who you are. Even if it's as small as a, as a measure of yeast into an entire loaf of bread, it can change its entire future and the entirety of how it looks. He says, so pay attention to the things that you feed on because the enemy likes to use little things to twist a big life. He likes to scoot little things into a heart, into a home, into a marriage, into a business to twist it and to change it. 
And I think that's the grind for us is that so often in our life, God's speaking to us spiritually, but our appetites are looking at other things. That we're looking at things that, hey, you know, that, that could enrich me. I'm going to bring this in, but it's not. It's going to hurt you. I think that what Jesus is teaching us here is that a true spiritual life is a very simple mechanism. That we need to keep our spiritual life simple. And that's what he's going to teach us today. Jesus is enough. That when you talk about your future and talk about everything, he just says, I want to be enough. It's not Jesus plus X, Y, and Z. It's not Jesus plus this new ingredient. It's just Jesus. Keep it focused on me. And if you keep it focused on me, he says, you're going to understand spiritually what is going on around you. So let's jump back to John 6. And we'll see this story that I just read from Matthew show up there. So this is 6-5. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. So he's looking up and he sees this thousands of people. Turning to Philip, which poor Philip is probably just the closest disciple to him. He asked, hey, Philip, where are you going to buy food for all these people? And Philip's like, uh, squeeze me? Like, what? what? Hey, Philip, where, where can we buy food for, for all them, the, the 5,000 plus people coming our way? Now, you can only imagine what happened in Philip's head. It literally exploded with, uh, uh. But listen to the next verse, 6. It says this, he was testing Philip. <laughs> this was a test for Philip. He already knew what he was going to do. He already knew what he was going to do, so he just kind of wanted to blow Philip's mind. Hey, Philip, we got to feed all them people. How do you think we should do it? And so often, I think in our life, because we're so tangible bread-minded that we think a test, we, we, we miss, we think it's a need, but really it's just a test. That we think it's something that we really, really, really need, but God says, no, it's just who you're going to put your faith in. And so Philip says, well, listen, I, I think this is what we can do. Verse 7, so Philip goes, well... Jesus, even if we worked for months, not a month, but months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. It's impossible. Like, you know, even if we rallied together and, and you know, did a multi-level marketing scheme, like we couldn't, we couldn't pull this one off. We, there's not enough T-shirts in the world we could sell, Jesus. Like, how can we do this? I mean, so what, what are we going to do? I mean, this is too big for us. And this, I think we do the same thing that Philip did when things get too big for us. We, we naturally go to this natural disposition. When we have a problem, when we have a need, when the water's too deep, when we don't have enough, we just begin to think about and we do the math in our head of this is how I can get myself out of this. This is how I can meet this need. But if Jesus wasn't really looking to Philip to meet the need, Jesus was just seeing what Philip would say. The question is then, do we ever really have a need if God plans on meeting them? Do we live our life thinking that we have needs, that we're, we're trying to persuade God and show God something that's going on in our life when he already saw it coming down the road before we did? Do you ever really have a need if you serve a God that's more than enough? Or is it just a need that you think that you have? If the answer is always Jesus, if the answer is that Jesus had the answer before he asked the question, then do we really have a question that needs to be answered by ourselves? Or can we just look to the one who asked us the question and say, how do you want to do this? See, I, I want to give you a cheat for your next life test that you're going to have, because we're all going to have them. The answer to whatever you're facing is just Jesus. But Eddie, it's a marriage problem. It's Jesus. Eddie, it's a business problem. It's Jesus. Eddie, it's a health problem. It's Jesus. Eddie, it's an emotional problem. It's Jesus. And I'll show you why. Jesus is going to teach us that this is the lesson, right? So verse 11. Then Jesus, and this is after they got five barley loaves and two fish from a little boy. They took the kid's food, right? So that's really good, not a good thing. So they took the food and from this kid in verse 11. Then Jesus took the loaves and he did what? He gave thanks to God. He said, Father, thank you for these five loaves and these two fish. God, thank you for this provision. Then he began to distribute them to the people. And afterwards, he did the same thing with the fish. And scripture says they ate as much, as much as they wanted. People ate as much as they wanted. No rationing, no limitations, no two burger limit. No, hey, you can only have one and then pass it around. We all got to share as much as they wanted. How did Jesus have as much as they wanted? He did one thing. He simply took what he had and he gave thanks to God. And he said, God, I thank you that you're going to meet this need. Have you ever considered when you come into a place in your life where you don't have enough, when it's too much, 
When you look at the horizon and say, even if I work a whole lifetime, I can't fix this. Have you ever thought to just stop and say, God, I thank you for what I do have. And God, I thank you that you're going to meet this need. I thank you for the wisdom. I thank you that you're the open door. God, that, that, that I just trust you in this. And I'm just going to step forward with what I have because you are the God who is more than enough. I may not be enough, but you are. I'm not going to go through life hungry and empty because I've, I'm satisfied with you. More often than not, we're like Philip and we, we, we get frantic. And we get scared and we say, man, I'd have to work a lifetime to meet this need. Verse 12. When they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, go gather the pieces that are left over. He says, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and they filled the 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. He says, listen, I I, I want y'all to remember this. So I want 12 baskets because I want each disciple tonight when y'all go to the boat, I want you to carry your little basket of food. He goes, because I want you to remember this lesson that I showed up strong in this impossibility in your life. See, the next thing then, all of a sudden, that we see in this story, so God, Jesus feeds the 5,000 people, and the 5,000 people do something that I don't think, so they showed up there wanting to hear Jesus teaching, but then something happens, is they want to make Jesus king, and they want to sit him on a throne of bread, basically, they said, well, listen, you know, since you already fed us, you know, then, then we just want to make you king because I mean, if, if we have bread every day from you, then, then that's what we want. And they confused who he is with what he can do. And they said, we're going to worship you because of what you can do, not because of who you are. They developed kind of a philosophy around it. Some people have developed theology around, well, well this is what God can provide. And they stop looking to him as the source and they start looking at what God can do. He's the bread, not what they ate that day. He is what satisfied, not what they had that day. And so Jesus says, listen, listen, I, I don't, I, I, though I am a provider, I don't want you, that to be the reason that you seek me. So what does Jesus do when they try to make him king of the throne of bread? Listen, verse 15. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. Jesus says, listen, if you want me to be king because I, I got you some, a, a loaf of bread, he says, I don't want to be the king of your, your bread. I don't want to be the king that you come to simply because you get hungry here and there. He goes, that's not the reason you seek me. That's not the reason I'm your king. That's not the reason you allow me to rule over your life. That's not it. So if that's the only reason you want me, I'm out. And scripture says Jesus slipped away. And then not long after that, the disciples uh, uh, jumped into a boat and began to go across uh, to Capernaum. And they hopped on the body of water. This is the same body of water. If you've read your Bible before, you may know this story where there was a demon-possessed man with a legion of demons. And so when Jesus went to go cast the demons out, the demons said, don't, you know, just don't send us up to run amok. Send us into that, that, those, those pigs over there on that hill. And so Jesus cast them into, the, into those pigs as the first devil hand ever recorded in history. And okay, the first service didn't laugh at y'all. They, they kind of grimaced the same way you did. That's a good preacher joke right there, y'all. They teach that in Bible school, all right? So they they run off and those pigs run off into this water and they drown. This is the same body of water. So you can imagine, this is like the the, the, the lake of of the devil pigs. Like it's just, so they're out there in the middle of the night. It's a little bit stormy. They're going across and they're like, yeah, this is the place where Jesus cast out those pigs. You know, those pigs died, right? Yeah. So where are those demons at now? I don't know where they're they're at. And And all of a sudden they see Jesus on the water like, it's a ghost. 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 You know, and, they, and Jesus is like walking, you know, like because he finished his prayer time. He's like, oh, there's no boats. I'll just walk. You know, and so he just he takes off across the lake and they're like, it's a ghost. It's a ghost. And Jesus, says, don't be afraid. It's me. And they knew his voice. And they said, OK. And they, and they calmed down. And I think many times in our life when we don't recognize God's hands, it's because God's doing something different than we've ever seen before. And that's why we have to learn to hear his voice, to recognize the works of, workings of God in our life, because sometimes God sneaks up on us in a way that we don't understand. So scripture goes on to say that, that next day they got to the shore, and that same group of people that Jesus just fed literally followed him from Capernaum, or followed them to, to, to the city. And so they show up, and Jesus was there, and, and they, this time they weren't seeking his teaching, because the first time those 5,000 people showed up because they wanted to hear the teaching, and they wanted to see the miracles, and they wanted to know the signs of what God was doing. But not this time. This time they showed up because they wanted bread. They wanted more food from Jesus. Forget the teachings. Yeah, that's all good, but I want some more of that bread. Verse 26 tells us this. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You don't want me because of, you, you want me because I fed you not because you understood the miraculous signs. Jesus says, now you're, you're not seeking me for the teaching, for what I, what I can impart into your life. He says, you're just teaching me because you're hungry again. 
They weren't searching for him. They were searching for the bread. See, when they first met Jesus, they were so happy and they were amazed and they were encouraged. They were, it was a life-giving message that he was bringing. And, and, you know, and, 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 and so many times in life, and then all of a sudden they changed from like, I want to hear his message to, well, I just want more of the bread. And I think that happens in our life too. I think when we first come to our relationship with God and, and we, we have that first encounter with him, and it's such an amazing encounter. God, thank you for forgiving my, my sins and thank you for loving me. Thank you for your presence. But then all of a sudden we start praying and God answers some of those prayers and then sometimes God doesn't answer all of our prayers and then we understand like, no, 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 you're, you're, you sit on a throne of bread. You're supposed to answer my prayers and give me the things that I want. And so sometimes the, the business plan didn't work out or sometimes the wart didn't get healed, you know, like sometimes the, that you, you don't get the promotion you pray for and the company does cutbacks and, and and all of a sudden you're like oh I don't know if I like church and I don't know if I and all of a sudden this Jesus that you were so in love with if he doesn't dole out the bread on a regular basis you get offended with him and say no 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 I want what you can give me I don't want you I, I, I where's the bread that that's why I'm seeking you and Jesus says listen I don't want to sit on some throne of bread I want to be the bread I want to be your everything I want to be the reason that you seek me so verse 27, Jesus said this to them. Don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Don't. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. He says, don't spend your life doing that. So then they kind of back up and they rethink their strategy and they don't give up. I appreciate their persistence. They're dumb like me. So they just keep going after trying to get the, the, the answer, Right? So the verse 28, they says, listen, let, let's try this another way. They replied then, listen, if you don't want to give us the bread, then, then we want this. We want to perform God's works too. We, we want to make bread. I mean, if you don't give it to us, teach us how to make our own bread. And Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you, is that you believe in the one that he sent. They say, no, 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 we, teach us how to make more bread. If you don't want to give it to us, then just teach us how to make it. And Jesus says, no, the greatest, the only thing God wants from you and the greatest work that you can ever have in your life and the greatest faith and trust you can ever express is just to be pointly, pointed and focused on him and say, all I want is you and I want to learn everything about you. You satisfy my soul. After my soul is satisfied, there, everything in this earth pales in comparison. And so they shift again after Jesus didn't answer the question that he wanted. And they say, well, listen, okay, if you're not going to teach us how to do it, then, then we need a sign. We, we need you to prove that you're worth trusting in. Because you know what? You, know, we don't, we, what, you haven't done enough. You, it, we, we really just need you to kind of do something to help our faith. And if you don't show up over here, we're going to have to stop believing in you. So listen, Jesus, you're going to have to put out, like you're going to have to do something, maybe some dinner rolls, you know, give us, give us a sign. So they answered this, verse 30, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? What a question. What did Jesus do the other day? He provided, he fed them all. But this is the problem with our appetites that aren't filled with him, is they're constantly renewing themselves. You will never have enough to be satisfied with the things of this world. It's like the food that's going to go in your belly after service today, a few hours from now, or if you're, in my case, me, a few minutes from now, you'll be hungry again. And then what do you do? You go searching for food again. They're looking for another sign because why? Because they never truly fed on him. They just fed on what he could do. And the problem is, is that when we have an appetite based on bread and not on him, we never get filled up. So it goes on. After all, verse 31, our, and they're, they're telling Jesus, they're like, let me explain this to you, Jesus, because you're not getting this. Let me teach God a lesson real quick. Sit down, Jesus. After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness and the scripture says, M Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus says, I tell you the truth. He goes, I got a lesson for you. He says, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you true bread. True bread. True bread. Not the kind you eat, the kind that fills your soul. True bread. For the true bread of God, verse 33, is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then they said, okay, sir. Verse 34, give us, give us that bread every day. If there's bread like that, we want it. 
If there's something that, that seriously Jesus can go in and satisfy the deepest parts of who we are, that, that we never have to, 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 to deal with uh, appetites again, if there's something in our life that can be so satisfying that whether it's a good day or a bad day, whether I'm young or old or rich or poor, it can satisfy this hunger on the inside of me. If that bread exists and I want it, and then Jesus says, this is where you'd find that bread. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty again. I am the bread of life. Stop seeking a loaf of bread and come after me because if you seek me, if you let me fill you up, you're not going to be looking at people to fill you up. If you let me fill you up, you're not going to need that job or promotion to make you whole because it's going to leave you empty after you get it, after you cash the check, after you buy that car, after you buy that house, after you marry that girl and marry that boy, you're going to come back empty because I am that bread. That never leaves you hungry. So seek me. Jesus took them full circle. They started off seeking him because of the message and what, who he was. He provided for them and then they got twisted and they, and they tinkered with their faith and thought, let's just seek him for what he can give us. But then he brings them full circle and he says, listen, if you want to be full, to live a life not driven by your appetites, you've got to fill up on me. Jesus says, you're not going to get anything from me unless you understand that having me is everything. You're not gonna put me on a throne of bread in your life and make me provide stuff for you. There's the only way that you'll seek me. And if I don't provide it, then you won't believe in me. And if I don't do it enough or quick enough or fast enough or long enough, you're just gonna give up on your faith. If I've gotta do that as signs for your faith, then you're not truly feeding on me. You're only feeding on what I can give you. He says, uh, you really can't get anything from me. I won't sit on that kind of throne. I have to be the bread. As soon as I am everything, you can receive something because you no longer need it. But as long as you need it, he goes, I'm not going to give it to you because I, you'd, be te- you'd be hungry for the wrong things. So seek me. I am the bread of life. Whoever hungers after me will never be hungry again. Seek me. As long as you seek me for something, you don't need me for everything. But let me be your everything. And if something is the only reason that you seek me, it's the only reason you desire me, you're probably not going to find me. Because I don't sit on a throne of bread. I am the bread. You don't truly have me, Jesus says, until I'm your everything. Until I fill you and I satisfy you. Until till I, I am your bread, I am your water. I am the most valuable relationship in your life. You won't throw me aside for somebody else. Until I am that to you, you don't truly understand who I am, nor do you, can you receive from me everything that I want to give to you because you're still going to have this appetite, this yeast of the Pharisees, this little side hustle over here that you're always trying to whip up over here and say, well, I just need that to meet my need. And he says, no, I will not be that person. I want to be the only one. Those other things are useful. Those other things may be wanted. You, you may love your family, love your, love your spouse, but he goes, you're the, I'm the only thing that you need. He says, don't turn me into a bread store because I am the bread of life. Hunger after me and you'll never be hungry again. Because every time we put him on a throne of bread and say, I need Jesus plus this, he hops off that throne and says, you know what, I'm not gonna play that game. I wanna be your everything. When you go through the darkest night, you still have everything because you got Jesus. When the marriage is tough and you're having some tough moments, you're not losing it all. You're saying, you know what, I still got Jesus, and Jesus is going to get me through the other side of this. As long as I've got him, I've got peace, I've got joy, I've got somebody on my side, I've got an advocate, I've got some wisdom on my side. That no matter how down you are and how much money you've lost, you still say, I've got a God that's a provider. Whether it's five loaves or 5,000 loaves, I, 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 he's my everything. He's going to get me through this. I'm just going to thank him from where I'm at and trust him in my future because i still got everything. You cannot take everything away from me because he is my everything. And we lose a lot in life because we think those things are everything and not him. But Jesus says, listen, if you got me, you should have everything. You are, you are, you are free from the entanglements of this world. And then you have the freedom just to enjoy me, and then I have the freedom to, to provide for you and do the things that I want to do for you because you're not seeking those things. You're seeking me. I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me will never hunger again. Never hungry again. Never hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty again. So if we're hungry today and we're thirsty today, we need to feed on him, not ask him to give him the stuff that we think will fill in the holes in our soul. So I want to, you know, some, I, I want to kind of break this down. I want to give you three go away points. Now, I know some of y'all thinking like, where's the blanks, Eddie? Like, you're probably thinking like, I missed the blank, didn't I? Like, they, they didn't put the blank on the screen. I got three blanks, and he hasn't given me any blanks. Like, where's the blanks, you know? So I got your blanks. Y'all calm down. Like, I got your blanks. You didn't miss it. You're not going to go have to ask people after church, like, what was number two? What was number two? Like, I didn't get number two. I got your blanks. You're, I got you. We're good. So this is it, number one. Be grateful for what you have, because with God, it's more than enough. When he brought Philip up there and they looked at that crowd, he says, let me show you, Philip, how to meet needs in your life in God's way. You just take what you have. Take your broken heart. Take your broken finances. Take your broken body. Take your broken dreams that aren't enough to finish it. And just say, God, I I push it all in front of you, Father, and I just thank you that you can take the leftovers of me and make something beautiful. God, you can take the finances that we lack and meet all of our needs. God, I thank you that you can take this broken heart and make it whole again. God, I thank you that you can take this, this rough marriage and rough family situation, God, and, and you, can, you can make us whole. God, I just trust you, God. I thank you that I don't have to go looking where the, how to meet that need, God, that you are the one who will meet that need, God. I just thank you for it. See, because so often when we pray and we seek God, we take inventory of what we lack, Instead of like the disciples and turn around and remember, hey, this is what we have. We have God on our side. John 4, 34 says this way. Jesus says this, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. He says, you want to know what fills me up, guys? He goes, every day I just do what God asked me to do. I'm the person he asked me to be. I'm the dad I'm tr- that God wants me to be. I'm the daughter God's asked me to be. I'm the, I'm the wife that God's asked me to be. I'm the, I'm the best employee in the company. I just, I just do the will of God, and, and I fill up on that. I, I'm not looking for anything else. I just wake up every day and just say, God, here I am today. Use me to be pleasing to you, and God, and I, and I get joy out of that. He goes, that fills me up. So for Jesus, he says, I, I woke up today and I, I got to teach these guys and, and, I, and I work with these knucklehead disciples and I, and I got some people, saw some people healed and he goes, that just filled me up because I just want to do what God wants me to do with my life. That's what matters to me. He also said in Mark 8, he says, if you try to hang on to your life, if you, if you try to feed yourself with all the things that life has, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, he says, you'll save it. If you just surrender in a heart of gratitude to him and say, God, all that I have, the good, bad, and ugly, God, I don't have enough to finish this race, but please take it and use it to finish your, my course. Be thankful. The second thing is this. Seek him for who he is, not what you need. When you come to the throne room of heaven, when you go, when you go to him, just say, God, I thank you that, that, Father, I seek you in this situation. God, I thank you that all these needs are met, but, Father, I just need you today. God, I worship you today, God, that I'm going to use my body, soul, and spirit to worship you, and, and the rest is going to come along. I'm going to pour out my life on the, I'm not going to pour out my life on the altar of perishable things. I'm going to pour my life out into you and just trust that you are enough to get me through this. Because what did Jesus say, verse 27, don't waste your energy striving for perishable food like that. Work for the food that sticks with you, the food that nourishes a lasting life. Food the Son of Man provides. He and what he does are guaranteed by God the Father to last. Don't pour your life trying to fill up on stuff that really doesn't matter. Seek him for who he is, not what you need. John, 1 John three twenty two, and we will receive from him whatever we ask because we obey him and we just do the things that please him. How do you live a life of God's provision where, 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 you, where need is not necessarily in the conversation? You just trust him while you just live a life that pleases him. And guess what? God's going to show up strong in those areas in your life. The very last lesson that I want to share with you 
from these teachings of Christ about I am the bread of life comes out of Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. He says, let us keep hoping. What was the lesson of Matthew 16 and the 12 baskets that came out of this miracle in John 6? Those baskets meant to have been lessons to remind them that I am faithful. Those baskets were in that boat that night on that lake when they thought Jesus was a ghost and they were scared. Those, les- those baskets should have reminded them, you know what, God was just faithful just yesterday. Why would he not be faithful today? And so many times in our life, we eat the bread and we forget the lesson. We forget that that basket's there to say, you know what, what did God deliver me from last time? Yeah, well, he's going to do it this time. How did God meet that need? Yeah, that's right. God was faithful here. And so many times we put God on reset and we say, you know what? Okay, you got to help me with my faith again. I, I, don't, I can't trust you. I can't trust you with this. Jesus, show me another sign. Give me another loaf of bread because I'm, I'm hanging here. I'm about to go. He says, no. The 5,000, those 12 baskets, don't you remember the God that you serve? You thought it was a need. It was just a test, and I passed it. We have to remember to have confidence in who he is. My third third point is this. His past faithfulness creates future confidence in us. He is the bread of life. Don't put him on a throne of bread and say, you know what, I need one more loaf from you to believe. Because he is the bread. He says, I want your singular purpose in seeking me is because you want me and I satisfy you and then you trust me to meet all those other needs in your life in the way that I see best. Because the truth is, if Philip was left in charge that day, nobody would have been fed. And the truth is, if we don't trust God and invest in him and squarely put everything in him, we're going to walk away from miracles that God could work in our life. But if we just seek him, if we just say, you know what, you're enough, God, right now, the bank account's short, it's in the red, but you are enough, so I'm going to seek you and trust you and fill up on that, then guess what? God's going to meet those needs. God's going to make it work. He's never failed us, not ever once. But we have to have our memory of who he is and not forget every time we have a need and say, I don't know if God can do this. It insults the character of heaven that we insult him with perishable things when he's an eternal God. Let me pray for you. Heavenly-